Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the daily chart of silver provided by netdania.com. And you can see that we have the MACD down below. We're actually at that positive crossover point, and we're at a positive 0.1237. So you can see that we've just crossed over. Now, that's not a super significant point, but it has marked rallies in the past. You can see here when we crossed over the zero line there we got a pretty big rally same thing here same thing here a little bit there a little bit there weaker and weaker so is this going to be a weak one or is it going to be strong when we when we continue on well one of the reasons i think it's going to be strong is if we look out at the weekly we can also see that we're nearing to a crossover as well. If we look over here, not a cross a crossover into positive territory, but a crossover of the red over the blue. So that's bullish as well. So that is a one-two punch. And then we can see here all the way out on the monthly, we're looking for that cross to shape up there as well. So that would be a very bullish formation if we got a one, two, three crossover in the daily, weekly, and the monthly charts for the MACD. Now, while this has been going on, silver has been, you can see, just fairly steady here, forming up a sort of extending pennant formation. You can see it's just going out in a flat line kind of in this pennant but uh, you can see that's definitely kind of a pennant formation there. Maybe we're getting close to a resolution on that. Now gold's doing the same thing. And while this has been occurring, there have been some extremely significant things going on in the other markets. So we're seeing gold and silver being very, very stable, whereas we're seeing the other markets going absolutely nuts. So let's look at some of these other markets here. We'll start off with the crude oil market, and that is in a very serious situation. You can see it got down to 57 on crude oil. When we go out to the weekly, we can see how serious of a situation that has been in the past. That marked, as I pointed out before, that marked the beginning of a serious financial crisis. Now, I'd shown you the crossover with the Dow, and I was pointing out that that seems to indicate that we're going to get a rolling over in the Dow. Now, we did get a 300 point down day on Friday, but you can see that the Dow has a long, long way to go for it to catch up with oil. We're talking about the Dow needs to be cut in half right now as it stands. For it to catch up with oil and we don't know if oil is going to keep crashing so these are some pretty serious warning signs that we have now of course the russian ruble we've been watching that closely that is still going into new lows versus the dollar and the situation would have to be getting fairly serious we could imagine that quite a bit of inflation is starting you can see we're up at 58 now on the ruble and uh, we had stabilized around 45, 46, and then it just took off again. So that is absolutely unprecedented what's going on in the ruble. Let's look finally at uh, the Chinese currency. And that's been the most stable of all the currencies. And you can see it's starting to put in a rally now. So I may be wrong on this one. I may have to eat my words and the the uh, dollar may actually begin to rally against the Chinese currency. Now, I don't know what possible reason there could be for that. We just had the trade deficit figures come in and China had the biggest trade surplus ever. But uh, these markets don't always follow fundamentals. They follow currency flows. So we are getting a rally in the dollar versus the Chinese currency. So let's look at some stories here. The main story I want to cover is about the position limits, but before we do that, I want to look at this crimebus or cronybus bill that they passed. You know that the Congress just came out and passed this bill. Now, this is just hilarious to me for people who believe that 
the Republicans got some kind of mandate or that they're conservatives, which is just absolutely silly that anybody could support them. But you can see that they joined together with the Democrats and they passed this crony bus bill. I already covered all the pork and fat and paybacks and crony uh, rewards that were in it. But even more important than that, they put this $303 trillion derivative deal in there to basically put the banks under the FDIC for their derivatives trades. So let's read a little bit of this. Courtesy of Crony Bus, last minute passage, government was provided a quid pro quo $1.1 trillion spending allowance with Wall Street's blessing in exchange for assuring banks that taxpayers would be on the hook for yet another bailout as a result of the swaps push out provision after incorporating explicit city group language that allows financial institutions to trade certain financial derivatives from subsidiaries that are insured by the FDIC explicitly putting taxpayers on the hook for losses caused by these contracts. Recall, five years after the Wall Street, Street coup of 2008, it appears the U.S. House of Representatives is bought and paid for as ever. We heard about Citigroup crafted legislation currently being pushed through Congress back in May when Mother Jones reported it, fortunately, and there's what they included from the article. At least we now know with certainty that to a clear majority in Congress, one consisting of Republicans and Democrats... The future viability of Wall Street is far more important than the well-being of their constituents, which also implicitly was made clear when Hank Paulson was waving a three-page blank check term sheet and when Congress voted through the biggest bailout of banks in history back in 2008. The only question is when the next multi-trillion dollar or perhaps quadrillion dollar now that all global central banks are all in bailout takes place. So this was in essence the gutting of Dodd-Frank. If you remember, they repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, which prevented the commingling of customer deposit funds with bank gambling funds. And they repealed that under the Clinton-Rubin years. And that set us up for the financial crisis. That set us up for too big to fail. So after Wall Street was bailed out by the taxpayer, uh, Congress felt that it had some kind of mandate to do something. That's when we got Dodd-Frank. And Dodd-Frank was supposed to stop the too big to fail. So the idea was that there shouldn't be any banks that are so large that they can bring down the system. So obviously, then what must happen from that is that certain regulations and walls should be put in place and then in my opinion of course the banks should be broken up and split down into smaller pieces but actually the opposite happened the banks got larger the biggest criminals in that scam were rewarded and made larger they wiped out lehman and, and then the smaller banks were consolidated and now we have basically a repeal of dodd frank so there they go again we knew they were going to do it um, were on the hook for another big blow up. Now, on that topic, the CME has come out and put in these daily limit moves. So are they expecting a big blowout here going on uh, soon to happen in the metals markets? What do they know? CME implements gold precious metal circuit breakers up to $400 wide. With Memorandum S7258 titled Implementation of New NYMEX COMEX Rule Regarding Special Price Fluctuation Limits for Certain NYMEX and COMEX Metals Futures and Options Contracts released moments ago by the CME Group and set to become effective December 21st, 2014, which seeks a five-minute trading halt when price movements in a lead month of primary futures contracts result in triggering events as a measure that is consistent with the promoting price discovery and cash futures price convergence in order to deter sharp price movements that may, for example, be driven by illiquid central limit order books prevailing from time to time in otherwise liquid markets. 
One wonders why now and what does the CME know about upcoming volatility or lack of liquidity in the precious metal space that nobody else does? Very interesting question. So think about that question of about why now. Let's go back and look at the silver chart. Uh, we'll go out to the weekly. Uh, actually, we don't need to because we can see it on the daily. So if we go back, taking you back in history here, let's take a look at some of those daily price moves that we had. You can see here, here are the moves. This, this is, uh, actually this is in September, but here's some of the moves from September. We've got $40 down to 35. We've got another daily move here from about I'm drawing a bunch of lines here, so let's clear all this off. So we've got a move here from about 36.50 down to 29. So there's a $7 move in a day. And we had something similar back here with that May top. So massive moves have already taken place in the silver market. You can see obviously that the only major moves from here, really when you're talking about dollars, and that's how they did it, three, six, nine dollars, uh, three, six, and nine dollars to take us to zero. So it's not gonna be for the downside. Uh, it looks like they're lining up for some major price moves to the upside, and they're gonna try to quell those or tamp down on those. Now I wanted to take you to an interview with Michael Marcus from Market Wizards because that's gonna give us a little bit of insight into these limits that they put on commodities markets. Now those limits have always been in place in the grains and the other soft commodities, but they haven't been traditionally in place, precious metals. Now they are. So what is the effect of these limits? What are the, which are effectively price controls? Now in the 1970s, we'll see here, that Nixon had actually instituted wage and price control. So not only had they fixed daily limit moves for these markets, but they actually had fixed absolute price limits for some of these, which is just one of the stupidest things you could ever do. And we'll see here, but that's in essence an analogy of the silver and gold markets, because although they don't have an official law that states that prices can't go above a certain point, they act as if they can't. So let's look and see what happened to Michael Marcus. And this is the interview with him from Jack Schwager's Market Wizards. Were you totally directing the trading in this joint account? He had set up a joint account with his friend. Yes, my friend didn't know anything about the markets. This was in July 1972. At the time, we were under price controls. The futures market was supposedly also under price controls. So there were price controls for the cash market, but it was unclear as to whether or not those price controls actually applied to the futures market. Marcus was trading in the futures. This was Nixon's price freeze? Yes, as I recall, the plywood price was theoretically frozen at $110 per 1,000 square feet. Plywood was one of the markets I analyzed for the firm. The price had edged up close to $110 and I put out a bearish newsletter saying, even though supplies were tight, since prices couldn't go beyond the $110, there was nothing to lose by going short at $110. How did the government keep prices set at limits? What prevented supply and demand from dictating higher prices? It was against the law for prices to go higher. You mean producers couldn't charge more for it? Right. What was happening, though, was that the price was being kept artificially low, and there is an economic principle that an artificially low price will create a shortage. So shortages developed in the plywood, but supposedly the futures market was also under this guideline. However, no one was sure. It was sort of a gray area. One day, while I was looking at the quote board, the price hit 110, then it hit 110.10 than 110.20. So in other words, the futures price was trading 20 cents over the legal ceiling. So I started calling around to see what was going to happen, but nobody seemed to know. Was plywood the only market that was exceeding its price freeze level? Yes, anyway, nothing happened. I think the market closed somewhere over 110 that day. The next day it opened at about 110.80. 
I used the following reasoning. If they let it trade over 110 today, they might let it trade anywhere. So I bought one contract. Well, ultimately, plywood went to $200. After I bought that first contract and prices rose, it was just a matter of pyramiding and riding the position. Was that your first really big trade after you'd been wiped out in the corn market? Yes. Did the cash plywood market stay at $110? The futures market functioned as a supply of last resort for users who couldn't get supplies elsewhere. So basically it created a two-tiered market, a sort of legal black market. Yes, those who were frozen out because they didn't have any long-standing relationships with producers could get their plywood at higher prices in the futures market. The producers were fuming at the thought they had to sell at the legal price ceiling. Why didn't the producers just sell the futures and deliver against the contracts as opposed to selling in the cash market at the price controlled level? The smarter ones were learning that, but it was in the infancy of futures trading in plywood and most producers weren't that sophisticated. Some producers probably weren't sure that it was legal to do that, even if they thought it was, their lawyers might have told them, maybe people can buy plywood at any price in the futures market, but we better not sell and deliver above the legal ceiling. There were a lot of questions. Did the government ever try to interfere with the futures market? Well, not exactly, but I will get back to that. In just a few months, my $700 had grown into $12,000 trading plywood. Was that the only trade you had on? Yes. Then I got the bright idea that the same shortage situation was going to occur in lumber. I bet everything on one trade, just as I had on corn, wheat trade, expecting that lumber would also go through the ceiling price. What was lumber doing at this time? It did nothing. I just watched plywood go from $110 to $200. Since they were both wood products and lumber was also in short supply, I reasoned that lumber could go way up, and it should have. However, after I bought lumber at around $130, the government finally woke up to what had happened in plywood, and they were determined to not let the same thing happen in lumber. The day after I went long, some government official came out with an announcement that they were going to crack down on speculators in lumber who were trying to ram up the market like they had in plywood. The lumber market crashed just on that statement. I was down to the point where I was close to being wiped out again. There was a two-week period during which they kept issuing these statements. The market stabilized at a level just above where I would have been wiped out. I had just enough money left to hang on to my position. The market was at $130 when you bought it. Where were the futures at this time? About $117. So even though the magnitude of this decline was much smaller than the price rise in plywood, you lost almost as much money because you had a much larger position in lumber than you had in plywood. Right. During those two weeks, I was constantly on the verge of being wiped out. It was the worst two weeks of my whole life. I went to the office each day, just about ready to give up. Giving up just to stop the pain or so that you would at least have something left? Both. I was so upset that I couldn't stop my hands from shaking. How close did you come to being wiped out again? Well, my $12,000 had shrunk to under $4,000. Did you say to yourself, I can't believe this and I've done it again? Yes, I did and I never did it again. That was the last time I bet everything on one trade. What eventually happened? I managed to hold on and the market finally turned around. There was a shortage and the government didn't seem to have the will to stop the futures market. Was it insight or courage that gave you the willpower to hold on? Desperation mainly, although there was a support point on the charts that the market couldn't seem to take out, so I held on. At the end of that year, the $700, which I'd run up to over 12000 and back to under 4000 was now worth 24000 after that scary experience, I never overtraded again. The next year, 1973, the government began lifting the price controls because the price controls had created numerous artificial shortages. When they were lifted, there was a tremendous run-up in many commodities. Just about everything went up. Prices doubled in many markets, and I was able to take advantage of the tremendous leverage offered by low futures margins. The lessons I had learned from Sakota about staying in markets with major trends really paid off. In 1973, my account grew from 24000 to 64000 And then he goes on to uh, experience with some limit down moves, so I want to talk about those real quick. 
Were you trading strictly on the long side? Yes, everything was going up. Although I was doing very well, I did make one terrible mistake. During the great soybean bull market, the one that went from $3.25 to nearly $12, I impulsively took my profits and got out of everything. I was trying to be fancy instead of staying with the trend. Ed Sakota never would get out of anything unless the trend had changed. So Ed was in while I was out. I watched in agony as soybeans went limit up for 12 consecutive days. So that's what we're talking about here, people. We're talking about limit moves. These are daily limits. As soon as the price went up as far as it could for that daily limit, the market was closed. So you'll see the effect of these limit moves. I was real competitive and every day I would come into the office knowing that he was in and I was out. I dreaded going to work because I knew soybeans would be bid limit again and I couldn't get in. So note that there. That's the effect of limit regulations. People who want to get in can't get in and people who want to get out can't get out. We'll see that next. Was this experience of not being in a runaway market as aggravating as actually losing money? Yes, more so. It was so aggravating that one day I felt I couldn't take it anymore and I tried tranquilizers to dull the mental anguish. When that didn't work, somebody says, why don't you take something stronger called Thorazine? I remember taking this Thorazine at home and then getting on the subway to go to work. The subway doors started to close as I was getting on. I started to fall down. At first, I didn't connect it with the Thorazine. Anyway, I wandered back home and just fell through the doorway. It was that strong. It knocked me out. I missed work for that day. That was the low point in my trading career. Around that time, I would occasionally have to go over to the cotton exchange. I would have an adrenaline rush when I heard the traders yelling and screaming. It seemed like the most exciting place in the world, but I learned that I needed to show $100,000 net worth to get in. Since I had virtually no assets outside of my commodity account, I couldn't qualify. I continued to make money in the markets, and after several months, I had surpassed the $100,000 mark. Around that same time, Ed Sakota recommended that I go long coffee, so I did, but I put a close stop in under the market just in case it went down. The market turned down and I was stopped out. Ed, however, because he was a major trend follower, had no stop and ended up being locked in a limit down market for several days in succession. Each day, Sakota was locked in a losing position while I was out of the market. That was the exact opposite situation of the soybean trade when he was in a winning trade and I was locked out. I couldn't help it, but it, I felt a sense of joy. I asked myself, what kind of a place is this that one's greatest joy is to be found when somebody else is getting screwed? That was the point I realized that what I was doing was too competitive and I decided to become a floor, tr floor trader on the New York Cotton Exchange. So again, another interesting interview from Market Wizards that gives you an example of limit markets. Not only gives you an example of limit moves in markets, but also gives you an example of price controls in markets. And you can see neither one works. Price controls in markets ultimately create shortages. That's the position we already are in, in silver. We have a shortage right now. Although they're managing to deliver the physical, the mint has been on allocation and there's just not enough physical to go around at these prices. But the way that the government deals with that, of course, is they're going to come out with their daily limit moves. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to lock people in. It's going to lock the shorts in. They won't be able to get out because the markets will go limit up. So if you think about that, those limit moves prevent people from covering. Now, it's not exactly the same situation because there is a cash market. But uh, what the government seeks to do with these things does exactly the opposite because you saw in that story that there was actually 12 days of limit up moves. So the, the limit, the halt in trading that the limits cause is actually worse than the price gaps and re reactions that you get by just letting the market trade freely. Of course, the explanation they gave was that uh, there was illiquidity and that's why they had to do that. But if we look at the latest volume from silver, we can't say that there has been illiquidity. So that certainly can't be the reason. So once again, the government is 
going to come in and try to stop the markets from going where they need to go. We know where they need to go. They need to go way up from here. And again, the government is not going to be successful. And we'll talk to you next time.